Concerns about slowing growth and demand are raising questions about the future path of many parts of the market, including the mining space. Amid that backdrop, TD Securities just wrapped up their latest mining conference, and joining us now with some of the big takeaways is Greg Barnes, Managing Director at TD Securities. Greg, back. great to have you back on the show today. Thanks, Rick. All right, so let's run down this conference. Uh, you, you had a note on it, a pretty comprehensive one. want to sort of move through some of the themes. The first one was copper and a bullish case for copper. Yeah, I think the tone of the conference was actually quite bullish overall, and particularly on copper. And we're watching Chinese reopening, um, you know, various pieces of unrest across South America. And people are concerned about supply on the copper side, primary mine supply. And inventories remain very low. And when we look forward a couple of years after the first wave of copper supply that we're seeing right now enters the market from a number of big mines just entering production now, there really isn't much beyond that. And I think people are concerned that how are we going to meet all this demand for copper from electric vehicles and decarbonization of the grid when we're just not producing enough copper? And I think the expectation is that copper prices continue to move higher. Obviously, not in a straight line. There'll be volatility like we're seeing of the past week or so, but generally the trend looks like it's going to be up. Yeah, it's a fascinating space when you think about copper because you talked about the demand of electric vehicles. Of course, electricity, copper is pretty key to all of this. And so we know that this is a long-standing story. This whole EV story didn't just show up overnight. No. And yet we're worried about mines producing enough in the future. What, what is the, why is the will not there to mine more copper if we truly believe in this longer term? It's all about incentive pricing. The, the incentive pricing as a mining company you need to justify building that mine and where the new mines are going to be and they're in increasingly difficult spots in the world, higher elevation, uh, no infrastructure, no water, and you just need a higher price for companies to be willing to take the risk to invest in these big mines, and they require capex numbers five, six, seven, eight billion dollars. And to justify a return, and you're looking for a 15% return after tax, you can't justify that investment at 350 copper. You probably need 450 copper. So that's a big adjustment that the industry is getting itself used to uh, as we speak right now. Right, so that's the copper story. What's been interesting in the past uh, several weeks is gold as well, and uh, I guess this dance with the U.S. buck, but even gold itself. What's happening there? Some investors were getting interested again. Yeah, we, we got a more constructive tone on, on gold. I wouldn't say it was ravingly bullish, mm -hmm. but people are feeling more comfortable that with the Fed pivot coming, obviously not quite there yet, but interest rates, you know, they only quarter point last time, and at some point over the next year or so, they're going to start cutting rates. Weaker U.S. dollar, trans that translates into a weaker U.S. dollar, and that's bullish for gold. So the question is, do rates stay higher for longer and inflation comes down, and then you get real rates rising? That's not necessarily good for gold. But on our analysis, if you look at Fed rate cuts over history, uh, gold does tend to outperform. Um, during a rate cutting um, period, gold tends to rise by about 34%. When they're raising rates, gold only goes up by 6%. So, you know, the risk reward is actually pretty good if we are entering into a rate cutting um, period from the Fed. We talk about a more constructive tone in the market toward gold for those reasons, but we also have a pretty big deal yes. on our hands today on Newmont. It was a 17 billion, nearly $17 billion bid uh, for Newcrest. What does that kind of activity in the space tell you about how the market's feeling about gold? Well, I think what investors have been looking for for a long time is further consolidation. There are quite a number of gold companies out there, particularly in the mid-cap space, and we've been watching consolidation happen over the past decade. And there is anticipation there will be more consolidation occurring, as, as we're seeing today. And I think part of this is just getting bigger, and gold mining companies aren't that big on a relative scale versus other sectors in the market. And to try and get big investor attention, they need to be bigger. And I think that's part of the rationale behind Nuance. Uh, you know, conditional bid so far for Newcrest. Okay, let's talk about uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, so many parts of the market, so many parts of society have felt the pressures of inflation. What about those pressures on the mining business? Yeah, they certainly haven't escaped them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been tough over the past year. We've seen costs, operating costs, go up by 12 to 15 percent on a year-over-year -year basis. Capital costs have gone up more than that, 20, 30 percent in some cases. And it's all the typical things that feed into it. Higher energy prices, higher steel prices, labor costs have gone up a lot. Now those costs have started to moderate, perhaps except labor. So we don't expect the same level of cost increases year over year in 2023. Zero to 5% is, seems to be what companies are guiding towards. So lower energy prices partly offset by higher labor costs. So less cost inflation in 2023, but still not great on the cost side. 
I think about the miners, depending on what they're mining, but say gold, for example, there's always that all-in cost, right? It costs mm -hmm. us this much all-in to get an ounce of gold out, and obviously if an ounce of gold sells for more on the market, then you're in a good position. Are, are the mining companies still in a good position relative? Yeah. Gold prices are $1,800, $1,900 an ounce, and the all-in sustaining cost, as we call it, is roughly around 1200 So they're still making a pretty good margin at these prices, they're still generating free cash flow. Um, so yeah, it's still a good setup for the gold space at these prices with costs, even with costs where they have risen to over the past couple of years. Right, another interesting part of the market, it was outlined in your note about the conference, is uranium. It seems that there's a different kind of tone around nuclear these days. Absolutely, and I think people are looking at where the world needs to go to reduce carbon emissions, and obviously electricity generation is a big part of that. And effectively, nuclear generating capacity is zero carbon emissions. Um, and we've recognized, I think governments globally are recognizing a couple of things. One, you can't support a, a global grid or a countrywide grid on solar and wind. It's just not stable enough. So you need that always on base load power, which nuclear gives you. And then I think it's been brought home, particularly in Europe, about the security of supply, where they've relied on Russian natural gas. And that's clearly not doable anymore. So nuclear is probably going to play a much larger role in, in both cases lower carbon emissions and security of supply going forward, in our view. How is Canada positioned against other uranium producers? We, I understand we have a pretty rich vein of the stuff here. Yeah, we're well positioned. We've got the world's biggest, well, one of the world's biggest uranium producers, Cameco. Um, they've got high-grade mines, long-life mines in northern Saskatchewan, uh, low costs, 20% uh, of the market generally is what uh, Canada can produce. So that's a, that's a very powerful position. Plus, given the fact that we're in Canada, low political risk, uh, the security supply argument works very much in their favor as well. So we are extremely well positioned on uranium. So we got some uh, sort of bullish in some spaces, constructive in other spaces, depending on what we're talking about in the mining space. What's the biggest risk to the sector this year in the short term or medium term? Well, really, the Chinese reopening and global growth as a whole. Uh, I think a soft landing is increasingly being talked about. If that is the case, that will bode well for demand globally. The Chinese reopening has really got metal prices off to a strong start. I think one of the factors that got metal prices off to a strong start so far in 2023. If that accelerates, that will continue to be very supportive of metal prices. But if it fades, and it's not the big bounce that we all expect, that would clearly weigh on metal prices over the balance of the year. 